morning and welcome to you all. Morning. Hang on, I'm going to take off my mask here so you can. Actually, are people with whole faces, but who extend the courtesy of wearing masks on behalf of those among us who may be more vulnerable. And as COVID rates are rising, we want to be careful and we don't want to be a part of the problem. We want to be a part of the solution. So we thank you for your understanding of our wearing masks and the need to wear them in the church. And we believe that it just means that you are a living example of what love looks like. So thank you for that. We started off this morning with this great collect. You can see it right there in your bulletin on page two. We prayed, oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpasses our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that loving you in all things and above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Wow. That's such a great prayer. It's so powerful. It recognizes the immense love of God and it promises us good things that are beyond our understanding. These are things we wouldn't even think to ask for or pray about. God is planning and preparing to give us. That's amazing. The prayer asks that God open our hearts and pour into them a love so strong so deep and so amazing that it will help us to see God in all things and above all things. It prays that we will be able to obtain these promises, but how could we possibly obtain these promises? It can't be by what we do, for none of us is perfect, and none of us is deserving of these gifts so holy. It can't be our behavior that buys us these gifts. So the prayer asks God to open our hearts and to pour into them a love so strong, so deep, and so amazing that we'll come to see in God's way. We'll come to see God in all things and above all things, and that's how we obtain these promises, the good things that are beyond our understanding. Love is the key. Love is the key to obtaining all of that. And yet, here I stand wearing my orange stole again. Along with all the other clergy who are wearing this stole today, we want nothing more than to put it away forever and to never, ever have to wear it again. Now, it's not what it looks like that is the problem that several of you mentioned this morning as you came in, what a beautiful stole, and it is. Look at the lovely color. Look at the beautiful images of children on it. It's a wonderful stole. It's not what it looks like that is the problem. It's what it stands for. That's where the problem falls. This stole does not match a single season in the church. It's not something that we wear when we gather to joyfully praise the Lord on Sunday mornings, or we come together for weddings, or baptisms, or memorial services, or other kinds of special occasions. No. This is the one we wear when families have been torn apart. This is what we wear when families have had stolen from them the opportunity to worship together on Sunday mornings and to be together as a family for baptisms and weddings and memorial services and special occasions. We wear this stole when hatred rears its ugly head and when gun violence takes innocent lives. We wear it when our hearts are breaking and when we once again need to stand up to the injustice of it all. I wish I didn't have to talk about this today. I wish I could preach about Paul's journey when he went to Philippi. I'd love to tell you about Lydia, this wonderful woman who was wealthy and a merchant of fine purple cloth and who was described as a worshiper of God and how as she stood and listened to Paul and his companions praying by the river that day, her heart filled up with a love so deep, so strong, so amazing 
that she and her whole household went and became baptized. She was converted. Her life changed forever. I'd love to talk to you about this morning's psalm because it sheds light on all the ways that the people are called to respond at those times when the Lord does great things for us, when the Lord fills our hearts with an amazing love so deep, so strong. I'd love to call your attention to the second reading of today, too. Oh, such great scripture. The revelation of John we heard today, which shared a vision of a new Jerusalem. This is a place that had no temple. You know why? Because the temple wasn't a place anymore. It was in them. It's a place where there was no need for the sun or the moon or the stars. Why? Because the glory of God shone so bright that that was the light by which they walked. The lamb was the lamp which, they, which lightened their way so that they saw and could understand. These are great scriptures. If we're to understand that passage as a prediction of things to come, it means that one day we will live in a place where light will always shine, where hope will be ever present, and where the, that love, that love of God will be the light by which we see and understand all things. And when that happens, darkness is going to have to flee because there's no way that darkness can exist in the presence of such a bright light. I'd rather talk to you about the gospel because today's gospel is the story of the waters by the sheep's gate where there was that pool that people gathered around when they needed healing, when they were desperate and nothing worked and they needed to get well. Some people believed that there was an angel who would come and stir the water. And so they would all sit around and wait. And when the water was stirred up, they'd run. And the idea was whoever got to the water first would be healed. So there's this great, massive running to the water of these people who are already injured and disabled and having some really serious challenges in their life. And they're trying to be the first one, even among those. They're trying to get there first so that they might receive healing. And Jesus sees this man there, and he's been sick for 38 years. So instead of helping him to the water, because when he says to the man, are you looking for healing? The guy goes, yeah, but I can never get to the water first. I have nobody to help me, and, and I can't do it. So he's assuming that Jesus might help him get to the water. Jesus doesn't worry about that. Jesus surpasses all that, and he says to him, pick up your mat and walk. And he heals him. And he doesn't end up having to be first, and he doesn't have to be best, and he doesn't have to earn it, and he doesn't have to do anything. He just needs to stand up and pick up his mat and walk because Jesus said so. Wow. I don't want to talk about gun violence. I don't want to focus on the darkness. But ten beloved children of God lost their lives in Buffalo last week. And one more was killed last Sunday in Orange County. And that's not all. According to the gun violence archive, since the beginning of May, so we're talking about the last 21 days, there have been a total of 38 mass shootings, leaving 37 dead and 185 injured. It seems that hatred is gaining strength and that evil has come out of hiding. So our diocesan bishop issued a pastoral letter this week, a word to the church on political violence and Christian citizenship, he called it. And I'm going to quote to you portions of it. We are required to either read it to you or provide it to you. And so I have copies of it on the welcome table on the clipboard. You're welcome to take a full copy so you can read the entire letter. It's kind of lengthy, so I'm going to give you parts of it. I also attached it to the e-news last week, and there'll be a little bit more in the coming e-newsletter this coming week. So that's how you'll get the whole letter. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some uh, portions of it as I read. It starts with this verse of scripture, which is a great reminder. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. My siblings in Christ, acts of gun violence, one of them in our own diocese, weighed on our hearts last week as we gathered to praise and worship the risen Christ. 
In the name of the Lord, I write with three invitations to the people of God. First, continue to pray for the victims of Buffalo and Laguna Woods, and I would add all the others too. For all of our black and Taiwanese siblings, for all who are at risk, risk from racist and gun violence, and for the reconciliation of the shooters to the heart of God. Two, to count the blessings of our freedom, even as we continue to perfect our politics, long distorted by the marginalization or exclusion of blacks, women, and immigrant workers of color who labor for the common good and pay taxes without representation. And three, to reflect on our obligations and opportunities as Christian citizens. Much has yet to be learned about the motives of the shooter in Laguna Woods, a seeming critic of Taiwan. His act of hatred came close to our diocesan family, for at least two priests and their families have ties to the Taiwanese Presbyterian congregation that he attacked, including the pastor, who courageously intervened to save lives. The murderer in Buffalo embraced a so-called replacement, great replacement theory, its white supremacist proponents deplore the cardinal virtue of democracy in a plural setting, believing that when more immigrants and people of color vote, fewer white people win elections. With our civic life so poisoned by prejudice, distrust, and fear, with the divisions continuing to deepen, how is a follower of Christ to obey the great commandment to love others while standing up for what we believe is right? Whatever your conception of Christian citizenship, Paul invites us to speak the truth in love. And that's not always easy. I understand it can be excruciatingly difficult to remain in relationship and community across difference while debating issues such as gun violence, voter empowerment, abortion, the death penalty, climate change, the rec and reckoning we owe for racism, alleviating food and housing security, and the work to which God calls us to break down barriers of race and nation, age and class, orientation and identification. It's hard to hear opinions we abhor and respond with love and without rancor. Our Lord said, everyone will know that you are my disciples by your love. My siblings in Christ, this is scripture I insist on taking literally. Jesus means everyone. By speaking the truth in love, by the way we behave toward one another and our neighbors, we exhibit the face and the purposes of God to a big, broken, skeptical world, even when the work is hard and the wounds are deep and the sorrow is too great to bear. Yours in Christ's love, the Right Reverend John Harvey Taylor, 7th Bishop of Los Angeles. And so today, I'm called to stand here in my orange soul, heartbroken and armed with nothing but love. I wonder, what are you called to do? What are we as a church community called to do? These are important questions that are worthy of our time and attention. And as much as I'd like to shut off the news and simply ignore the situation, the words that my dad often spoke still echo in my head. He frequently reminded us, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to stand by and do nothing. So my dear brothers and sisters, be loved of God, as by the way, are all the people of the world beloved of God, we need to shine our light. We need to strive to see God in all things and above all things so that together we can overwhelm the darkness. Now, what exactly that means and how exactly we do that is a very complicated question. The Episcopal Public Policy Network has some really good ideas and they do a lot of legislative work to try and stand up for justice and support, especially people who are marginalized. And I will put into the newsletter coming up some further information about that. But this complicated problem probably doesn't have a simple solution, right? A complicated problem 
probably has a complicated solution. It probably needs a million different responses, and each one of us needs to search our own hearts and figure out which of those responses we bear the responsibility of taking. I suggest we might want to start with today's collect and with other simple prayers, because if you make it too complicated, you're much more likely to just give up and walk away, and we can't do that. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as we look at this complicated problem, because we can't give up, and we can't give in until we figure it out. So pray. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to inspire you. And then, be willing to listen for a while. We also need to remember that the love of God is not just for people who look like us and talk like us and think like us and worship like us. Simply put, all I know is, God loves everyone, no exceptions. And it seems to me that that may be a great place to start. It's simple, but it says a lot. Let's get out there and spread the word far and wide. God loves everyone, no exceptions. And as you pray and are inspired by the spirit of the things that you can do to help, I pray that you find the strength to do those too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.